welcome to episode 3 of Easy Made Lemonade. We would like to acknowledge that we are recording in Vancouver on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Tooth First Nations. My name is Claire. And my name is Emily. It's April, and here in Canada, it is tax season, the epitome of adulting. Speaking of adulting, today we'd like to share with you a concept that we base a lot of our life decisions on, which we've termed price pending. This is also the title of today's episode. Is that purchase price pending approved? Emily and I come from Asian backgrounds, so we were naturally brought up to be economical and practical with money. But uh, living in Western society, we've also learned to treat ourselves, especially now that we're adults and have access to our own hard-earned adult money. For context, Emily, how long have you been working and making your own money? For me, I worked part-time as a tutor um, all throughout university. So I was in university for five years. So for five years of that time, I worked part-time as a tutor and made some of my spending money. It wasn't a lot because it was minimum wage and minimum wage here in Vancouver was very low. But anyways, I graduated from university in 2013. And from since 2013 till now, I've been working full time. About three years ago, I took a little bit of a break to change careers. I quit my first full-time job uh, and then was on search for another, my current job. So there was a little, there was a couple months break in between, but I would say I've been practically working nonstop uh, full-time since 2013 till now. Oh my gosh, almost eight years of full-time work. I, uh, that blows my mind. I never really calculated, but yeah, that's me. Um, Claire, how about you? Uh, How long have you been in the workforce and earning money? So I think the way my parents brought me up has a lot of factor into this because they didn't allow me to work until I graduated university. So I was in university for about three years. Um, I graduated 2012 and so I've been working ever since. Um, much like Emily, it's almost, I'm on my year nine of my current job. So my current job's the, the first, the only job that I have ever had. I'm still here, my happy place. And so that's all my story for my adult money. <laughs> so one thing we discovered through our friendship was that we actually have very similar spending uh, behaviors and our thoughts and, and uh, feelings about finances and money were actually quite similar and the way we you know justify our purchases were also very similar and so we coined a term called price pending and what that means is that a lot of um it's sort of like an internal checklist of how we justify if a purchase is worth going forward with it could be a lot of different things saving is a big part of our lives it will always be but it's always good to treat ourselves especially knowing that we have worked so hard i mean and there are a lot of people who work really hard for their money and it's all work and no play make people sad Uh, (laughs) but both my parents worked really hard when they were saving up money and everything and one thing they taught me is saving is important but they also always tell me if it's a quality item that you really do want and that can really make your life better those purchases are worth it and so price pending is something that we decide that value has to do a lot with is it is the value good it doesn't have to be the amount of the money it's value for the item you're purchased if the quality is good is the satisfaction there when you you know make that purchase so there's a lot of different things i think it's really hard to to put a specific list to it basically a lot of things we're going to discuss uh for the rest of the podcast is basically the price pending concept there's no one thing that can encompass everything so um can i just say um yeah the the way price pending came about was it's our way to compromise our internal conflicts like our values that we gathered as our parents brought us up and also the way they our parents taught us how to spend our money as emily said um it's saving is very important but also having um a good quality of life is also equally important and so we as adults we must find the balance yeah that claire put it really nicely it is the main thing about it is really improving your quality of life and sometimes to improve it it, it does have a cost but if the return is greater than the cost then it's worth it sometimes if splurging on an item even if it puts big dent on your wallet but if it really makes a very long-term difference then it's worth it 
I mean, always again within your means, though. I'm not telling you all in, like cash out your whole account to, for something. But if 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 it was a a bigger purchase than normal, and you're debating, you don't want to have what is the term that people use? They use FOMO, the fear of missing out.、Um, right. I don't. You know, there's certain things. It's all, like don't follow a trend, but you don't want that fear of missing out, right? You don't want to go back two years later down the road. Thinking, oh, why didn't I go ahead with that purchase two years ago? And now it's out of reach. You can never get it, and you're always thinking about it, and you you have regrets. And it's not just following trends and being in, but it's more of the internal satisfaction that it gives you. And in this episode, we're not just going to be talking about material things and how we spent on material things because we also do a lot of price spending brainstorming on、um, splurging on experiences. And so yeah. So let's first things first. Let's start with the big purchases. Things we do splurge. Splurge on. Let's talk about things that are worth the splurge. <laughs> Claire, what's something? What is something that we both agree on? That's you know, a really good investment. Well, there's a lot of things that we <laughs> that we agree on, <laughs> but、um, let's start with、um, material things first.、Um, when we say splurging on material things first, of course, the number one thing that comes in mind is luxury goods. That could be purses, wallets, shoes, clothes, even. But for me personally, I tend to splurge on shoes. The next one would be bags. In my late teens, I saw this quote. This might not be the exact words, but it said, "Give a lady the right shoes, and she can conquer the world." And I really related to that. That is very inspirational, right? And I like traveling, so I feel as if if I buy luxury shoes, <laughs> then I'll go to places with my super fancy shoes, and I'd be super happy. And so that's that's what goes in my mind when I splurge on shoes. I don't splurge as much on clothes, or sometimes a little bit on bags. But I'm on extremes, so I'd be very cheap on clothes, but be very extravagant with shoes. For me, I do purchase shoes,、uh, but not to the extent of of like the really nice luxury ones. For me, I buy bags. Not too much though. I tend to buy really small bags,、uh, small practical bags that I know I would get a lot of use out of. So that's one thing for me for luxury goods,、uh, wallets and bags, things I would actually have a use for.、Um, so one thing I, I always base my purchases with luxury goods is the cost per use. If you were gonna love it so much that you needed to buy it and then you used it every single day for years, then it it, it will balance out the price, right? One thing about luxury goods people have to remember is, of, of course, you buy quality. If you do your research. And you, you buy the ones that you know have are made from、um, better quality. You do get the bang for your buck. So I also never buy very crazy colors. I always stick with my usual, I, my go-to black. One thing people don't know is, if you buy it from, I mean, this is pre-COVID times. If you are someone who travels a lot, when you buy from different countries from the same brand, they could cost differently because of the exchange rate, because of the pricing、mm-hmm. difference, and. If it just so happens the country that time had a good exchange rate with your currency, it's actually really good to buy overseas or actually buy off an overseas site too with the、mm-hmm. exchange rate. So you could benefit if you actually did proper research. So it actually it's a lot of work for <laughs> for me when I buy these things. It's a lot of work. It's like I had to put so much. That's where my price pending、uh, hat goes on, and I like it's like a whole research project. I have to make sure is it justified? Where can I get the same item? For less money, of course.、Um, yeah, and another thing people don't understand is、um, certain brands, especially, can really hold their value, or their value actually goes up. So it's actually、mm-hmm. investment purchase too. People,、mm-hmm. uh, some people might not understand. There are certain brands I won't mention, but like the very, very high end, expensive brands out there, they're classic bags. If you had the money to initially to buy it,、uh, of course, make sure you have the money. Don't go buying one because I say it's a good investment. Those bags, the prices of those bags go up every single year. It has not gone down. That's right. They go up、yeah. every single year, even pre, you know pre-owned. If you sell them, you can sell them for if not the same price you bought it at at the beginning, or even higher. So you get to use this luxury bag for however long you want to. And if you decide you can't, you don't want to use it anymore. If you need to cash it out, you pop, you get all the money back. It's similar to buying stocks, but the thing about stocks is. It's volatile, and you can't actually hold the item. There's nothing for you to, to hold around. It's m- your own money. You see it go up and down. If you lose it, you lose it. The bag is yours. <laughs> the bag is yours until you don't want it, and then you can, and then you get the cash back. 
Um, but enough of that. But is, do you have anything to add to my well, let's, let's Let's actually talk about that. I probably don't research as much for shoes when I buy bags. But that's the same kind of thinking that I do as well when I purchase luxury bags is I, I try to avoid buying very seasonal items. Mm -hmm. um, there are items that um, say um, are produced with collaborative works with these famous designers. Those are really nice. They may hold value, but I still tend to um, skip those and just focus on classic styles. I don't have that much capital to buy on these um, really expensive special edition bags, you know? Yeah. So I try to just go with the black classic canvas yeah. or say like the prints that the brands are known for. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of pricings, I do know that at least for couple of brands they do price increases every quarter yes if it's something you were thinking about with luxury goods with items that you know will never ever go on sale right and let's say the prices even go up let's say it's, if it's an item that will never go on sale it's better to buy it early than later if you had the means and especially with luxury goods they never go on sale and they only go up and also it's not just that it's also stock mm -hmm. if you stock is always very limited with luxury goods so even if you wanted to buy it and lock it in at the cheap the lower price they might tell you there's no stock and you just wait it's a waiting game and it's also first come first serve a lot of times and by that time when the stock comes in it's in the pri higher price range. Exactly. So check number one, if things are in stock. If the things aren't in stock, then you don't even have to waste your time thinking because right. you still got to wait till they come in. But if it's in, in stock, then you can go, oh, check your means. If it is within your means and it is something you were wanting for a very long time, I think that is worth it. If it's something you impulsively went into store, never thought about, did no research and go, and, oh, that looks pretty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I don't know. That's up to you to decide. But, right. uh, but the thing is, I'm also guilty of that. I have done impulse buys. I'm doing it more often now, the older I am. But when my impulse buys are always not like, a very hefty purchase. I've been impulse buying some medium purchases. <laughs> medium <laughs> purchases. Days. Some medium purchases and my sister even was saying, my sister knows me as someone who's very level-headed and I am very rarely would go into a luxury store and impulse buy something. And one time I went in with her and I wanted to browse and before we left, I saw something and I bought it. And she was like, what? Who is this? Are you my sister? You bought it? And I literally held it in my hands tried it on and I'm like, yes, I will get this. <laughs> but then this um, comes back to the point of bringing in that self-satisfaction factor to buying luxury goods. And again, uh, this is just our preferences. That's that's our purchase behavior. Yeah. To summarize all this, the moral of the story about splurging on luxury items, at the end of the day, just buy the things that make you feel good and you won't regret. I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've had our impulse buys, you for your bags, me for my <laughs> shoes. But at the end of the day, I come home, I have these shoes, it's something I look forward to for the first few months, yeah. and it brings me happiness in that sort of way. Yeah, I, I don't regret my impulse buy and I use it. That's the thing at the beginning of my working career, when I bought nicer things for myself, I didn't want to use them because it was so hard to earn that money and I didn't want to wear it down and now that I'm older I go okay I bought these items for a reason I spend all this money for it I will use it and these days I don't use it rough but I've been using my items more and I have bought them with my money so I, I should use them <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's a good point to bring out too because that affects our purchasing behavior because as we age that we see the value of these things and how we how we view the the what's that called cost per use cost per yeah. use <laughs> Yep. Okay, so apart from luxury goods, Emily and I also do a lot of exchanges when we splurge on events. Emily and I, we've been watching a lot of events ever since university. And so I guess it's just one of the things that came about organically. Earlier in our 20s, there are more artists that we really want to see. And that's when they started coming in Vancouver as well. And so we started talking more about it. And so, Emily, do you want to share uh, to our listeners how we normally go about choosing which ticket to buy, when, and whatnot? Um, there are several factors on how we, de determining how we purchase our tickets. So, number one is 
how much we love that artist. If it was a bucket list artist we really want to see at least once in our lives, those artists, for sure, 100%, we joined that pre-sale line. We're going to find all the pre-sale codes. We are willing to switch all out and try to find the best seats for that artist right away. We would be on multiple devices. <laughs> I remembered I had all the apps open trying to like get these tickets. And so we clear and then whoever got the better seat would purchase the ticket. And of course, we would know the venue too. So number one, again, it's if it was a an artist we really really want to see all out we would go all out if it was the artist that we know comes frequently we want to see we like but don't love that's an artist we might not go all out we might wait a little bit and see the venue also plays a factor there's also a lot of last minute sessions that claire actually we both sometimes we don't know an artist is coming like an artist that we just discovered we're slowly liking and we don't know when they come because they're not as big and either claire and i we would message each other saying hey did you know this person's coming like next week Week or like in two weeks someone is coming and then we tend to be people who plan way ahead but there are times we also do last minute purchases or we purposely wait last minute because sometimes recently I've discovered there's like a lot of last minute ticket deals for those the tickets that don't get sold out so We've got a lot of different ways we buy t tickets. Oh, I also just want to mention how Emily and I, we really do value our money. <laughs> and so we're the type to research a lot first before we spend on something, maybe it's small or a big purchase. That said, we do a lot of research. Uh, Emily and I will set a price range of how much we are willing to pay for this type of ticket for this artist. For the two women in the audience who do a lot of brainstorming, <laughs> like we do a ticket purchase strategy before we we buy uh, tickets. I'm glad you mentioned that. I totally forgot because it's you know we haven't seen shows in so long. It's we 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 see shows all the time. Every season we probably see something together. It doesn't have to be a concert, but like almost every season in a year, we would go see something. Um, but yes, I totally forgot. You're right. We always. We would communicate what is the max and min price for this venue, for that concert. Yeah, there's so <laughs> many factors. Yeah, and for some artists that we love a lot, there's also a minimum too. Like we, we could go, I'm not going below, you know. I need to be upfront and close with this person. Or maybe this person's like, you know what? I'm fine up at the top of the balcony because I just want to see the, this person sing because they're not a great performer or something like that. Let's move on to talking about deals when we travel. So travel is another way that we splurge or <laughs> can you stop using the word splurge and just say spend? <laughs> spend. It's not a splurge because we definitely don't really splurge. Okay, the travel is definitely something I don't splurge, rarely, rarely splurge on. Right. So, so let's talk about that. How do we spend money on travel? Like for you? For me, there's actually a perk to working full time. In school, you're, you're bounded by your school schedule. And then you're bounded on, you know, when breaks are. And usually those peak seasons are when those school breaks are. With work, you can take vacation time. And with vacation time, you can always go low season. And that is a big thing for me. I always travel low season. Uh, not only is the price better, it's also less crowded. And also you can go when weather is better, which is also a big part for me. Uh, the weather plays a big part. Um, to the destinations I go. Most people would know I do a lot of price comparisons basically once I have a destination in mind. I do a lot of price comparisons on a lot of different apps out there that's available. Mm -hmm. A big part for me, I use Google Flights a lot. If I haven't de de determined my plane ticket yet, Google Flights is my number one go-to search engine because it also sends you reminders and notifications if you set them. So I don't have to be on it all the time. I can set a price, a reminder saying if the price drops to this destination, it'll send me an email, then I can book right away. And so I don't always have to be constantly checking. How about you, Claire? Is there something, um, other things for you when determining how to travel? So for me, when I travel, I tend to go back to the places that I've already been to. <laughs> <laughs> so that said, I tend to already know a bit of background knowledge and where to stay, where it's cheapest to stay for the best quality that I can get. Also, I, I like, like Emily, I also do a lot of price comparisons. I use Google Flights. Uh, Google Flights, hello. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or travel sites, say Expedia or Kayak. Yep. Also because when, when you book through these sites, you earn points. And earning points, using points, that's a big factor to my purchase behavior too. And so that's I, how I normally budget for travel. And speaking of travel, I just I, there's just one thing that I'm really curious about. When we fly, you know, we get the best rates that we think we can. And so 
<laughs> one of the things that happen after would be uh, paying fees for extra features to your flight, for example. So how, how is it like for you, Evelyn? Are you one of those people who purchase for extra uh, to get access to better seats? I am the person who will buy the cheapest plane ticket possible. There's actually a website that I follow that has all the deals specifically departing from Vancouver mm -hmm. and I love that site. It has that person. Uh, oh my gosh, thank you, this person. Um, he does such an amazing job. He compiles everything and I always buy the cheapest seats. I never ever, for some reason, it's something I won't splurge for because the price difference these days for flights and the, the next level up for seats, it's such a big difference. It's such a big jump. Even within economy class, if you wanna have extra leg room, it's a big jump. And then you want premium economy, that's like double business class don't even think about it so it's something that i don't think about you know that could be a goal down the road that i could like not think about prices and just book a business class but that's a big jump for me i'm someone thinking if i'm only on that as a piece of transportation to get me to the destination i can suck it up and uh, just go for the cheapest seat now there's a limit to how how low i can go though uh one thing about prices and flights these days are a lot of things are not included anymore in flights Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, baggage was included, meals were included. That used to be the basic. Now, that's not basic anymore. That Those are all extras. Now, all you get is a seat. At least for us here in Canada. Oh, right. I should... Uh, Canada, especially with short distance flights. International flights is different. You still have those options uh, for most airlines, not all. Mm -hmm. But within, especially domestic travel here within Canada and even to the States. When you purchase a seat, if you buy the cheapest seat, it is just a seat. And you don't even know which seat. You just wait day of when you check in, then you get a seat randomly assigned. So seat selection costs money. You're not allowed to bring any check bags. Those cost money. Some tickets don't even include carry-on bags. You have to pay for carry-on bags. Don't think about food. You'll get a drink, you'll get water. They'll probably give you some water. That's it. Food, don't, extra cost. Um, everything is extra, extra, extra. Um, so there's certain things I won't, if it was a really short haul flight, I'm not gonna buy food. I'm not going to buy bag. I'm not going to buy seat selection. If it's short haul, if I can manage, if they allow me to carry on for free, then what I'll do is I'll try my best to shove everything in my bag and bring it on board. I will not pay for the extra piece. International flights, usually baggage is included, seat selection is included, food's included. But if it wasn't included, I think the max I would splurge is for longer haul flights, you would need a larger bag. And with a larger bag, you would have to pay for bag. So... The only thing I would consider sometimes is depending on my the length of time of travel and how much I have to bring with me, I might purchase a checked baggage. But no, I never splurge for seats on flights. And an another thing I don't do is, so for food wise, if I have food is not included, I'm the person that I will pack my food. I will pre-pack my food at home. And even if I forget to pre-pack, I'd rather buy it at the airport and bring it on board than buy what's on the plane. But I think that's different for you, though, Claire. <laughs> no, no, well, not really. It, 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 it's really a different conversation for domestic flights versus international mm. flights. Mm -hmm. Because for domestic flights, I am the same as you. I would, I, <laughs> as much as I can, I would not pay for anything extra because that's just... For me, I feel as if domestic flights are expensive enough. And I'm not willing to splurge for seats for, for five and a half hour flight. Like, I can suck it up, too. Yeah. But um, for food, the same, because it's just domestic flight, then I just rather save my, my money and bring my own snacks than buy whatever is in the airport. And you know, you know, the kind of selection you get at the airport, they're not the best, at least for me, they're it's not like the cold. best. <laughs> I'd Sorry. rather spend my money buying snacks at a grocery store, like snacks that I really enjoy eating, than spend $7 for a small pack of nuts that I'm not really big on. Mm -hmm. Also for seats, I'm one of the people who wait for the window to check in and then just get my free seat there. Um, it really depends. There are very rare times that I pre-purchase seats just because they are red-eye flights and I would like to sleep as much as I can. But th that's very, like, I've only done that maybe twice, three times, but not as much. But yeah. as, <laughs> as Emily might have already hinted on, it's different for me for local uh, Philippine flights. For most of the airlines there, 
they serve this one type of cup noodles that I really, really am a big fan of. But just the smell of it is enough to entice me to buy a cup noodles. It's it's a splurge for me because I don't uh, I don't want to spend three times the amount for this cup noodles, but it's really good. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's one of my weaknesses when I'm traveling locally, like taking local flights in the Philippines. I must avoid smelling that cup noodles. Otherwise, I will buy one for myself. I mean, I'm happy because I'm eating it, but after the flight, I tell myself, why did I just waste my money on that cup noodles? <laughs> I, I, I'll let you know, uh, that cup noodle that you like is given out for free as a late night snack on Cathay Pacific uh, international flights. So when I fly to Hong Kong, when I used to take Cathay Pacific to Hong Kong from Vancouver, it used to be on the menu, but then they no longer put it on the menu. But it's something that when it's like, if you take the red eye or if you take, when it's like the bedtime when the lights are off, you can t ask the flight attendant and then go like, oh, can I have a cup noodle? I think they don't put it on the menu anymore. So it's, I think like old customers will know and then they'll bring you. You, you start knowing though, when the lights dim, you start smelling the cup noodles from the, from the, their galley. And then you're like, oh, I want one. And I always get one because it's free. It's in well, international flights, you know, meals are included. and. So that's the one perk on Cathay Pacific is you can have that. If you ever get a chance to fly long haul with them. But see, it's a it's a long haul. So it's, it's a long okay. haul though. Even if I pay for that, I might be okay. But see, my local Philippine flights, they're just, what, an hour and a half long. Oh, by the time so... you get it, it's done. Like, clear the <laughs> <Yes>. table. <laughs> That's why I feel like it's a splurge. <laughs> oh but I really gosh. cannot resist. Um, I remember I was in a flight once. It's a red eye flight. Uh, the cup noodles isn't free. I splurged on front seats for the leg room because it's a red eye flight. So, you know, uh, I already splurged on the seats. And then this guy, this guy on the other, it's just right next to me. It's just, he was just on the other, on the other side of the aisle. So very close. He ordered cup noodles and I had to pinch my nose for the first 30 minutes <laughs> just so I can avoid it. And the smell doesn't go away because you're in a plane. Right. And it's it's a red-eye flight. I'm supposed to sleep. My stomach isn't equipped to eat noodles. Oh, <laughs> Cut no. noodles at that time of the night. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think we also talked about how um, you also miss flight food too, right? A little bit. Yes, well, just because of the pandemic and there's we haven't been traveling a lot, I now miss being served sweet or salty. <laughs> I miss the, the the cookies that they serve or just being handed over um, the say apple juice, the, the nuts or yeah. yeah, the snacks or the drinks. I, I, yeah. It's just what one can of I the... get you today? <laughs> <laughs> just one of the petty things that I, I miss. I, yeah, I... Airplane food's never fantastic. Yes. But... I miss it. I miss it when I miss that like when they're waiting when you're hungry and you're waiting for them to come and you're like, I'm hungry, why is there still no food? And then they walk down the aisle, but the thing is you're you're not at the front of the row. They so they start at the front and then you're at the back. Or they start at the back and you're at the front. Like it's like oh and then you don't you're, you're you're hoping the option you want is still there because there's only two options. There's always only two. Maybe the vegetarian one, but like there's usually only two and then you really hope the chicken is still there, but you get the beef or the beef is still there, but you get the chicken. Oh my gosh. And I sort of miss it. I sort of miss like the little like you're eating cram. <laughs> You see, the, the point here is we just miss the experience, but not really the food itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's experience in the cramp. And then you got little like, OK, you got the salad and then like drink and like dessert and the meal. And like sometimes you burn your hands because it's so hot when you try to open the <laughs> cover and you look at the mush in front of you like, oh, sometimes it, when OK, you expect it to look like mush. But then when you open it, it looks pretty. You're like, wow, gourmet. <laughs> Your standards are so low with airplane food. But anyways, the moral moral of this story is we just miss traveling. We just miss traveling. It's just Wanderlust speaking right now. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of Wanderlust, um, one of the, it fall, kind of falls in the price pending concept is uh, foreign exchanges. Because, you know, you think about these things too when you're traveling, you know, what's best use for your cash. And you think, what is the best way that I can make the most use of my 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 cash? Yeah, speaking of foreign exchange, um, also, there are also credit cards. Mm -hmm. um, some people like to travel with cash. I did a lot of research and I'm actually someone who, if you have the right card, and there are actually some cards out there, 
the using a credit card is better than exchanging money because you lose from the currency exchange rate mm -hmm. anyways so if you're able to find a good credit card that can waive foreign transaction fees then it's the same as using cash because regardless you have to pay the currency conversion because there's currency conversion and most credit cards on top of the currency conversion charge a certain percentage mm -hmm. for foreign transaction fee on mm -hmm. top so that's why people choose not to use credit cards because they think it costs more but if you did your research and compare credit cards out there and you are someone who travels a lot it's worth it to apply for a card that waives those foreign transaction fees and then you don't all have to have a headache about always oh i have to go exchange money where am i going to exchange money do i have enough cash on me and whatnot and you can just swipe your card if you know your destination is somewhere that accepts your foreign card and almost all places you book these days require credit card anyways mm -hmm. to book uh, another perk about credit I'm doing a whole adulting thing about credit cards here um, another thing about credit cards is there are a lot of great travel credit cards so if you are someone who tra who travels a lot, is you know also post pandemic, we'll, we'll hopefully in this in the near future, um, a lot of credit cards are great for traveling because a lot of them include travel insurance. They might even include airport lounge passes. They might have events insurance, events perk, car insurance. There's a lot of things they cover. So sometimes it's worth it to look into those cards too instead of just a really basic card you don't realize there are a lot of things out there you you don't look at the fine print and you go like oh actually that card can actually benefit me a lot more than what my existing one is so feel free to take a look at that i'm someone who does a lot of research on credit cards and different perks so so i think the moral of the story for, for this part is really just do your research if you're if you're a younger adult try to spend a little bit more time thinking ahead try to predict what kind of behaviors you'll be doing like will you be traveling more will you be doing more local purchases and so most of the things like that they do factor in with your um, cash flow and your credit card use for, for me one of the perks that i like about using credit card is I get points <laughs> and again those points do matter if i really do uh, use the credit card a lot to, to add to that moral it's the price pending tip of the day for this section would be research really pays off mm -hmm. the research will help you save saving a couple dollars here and there can add up if you can save a couple dollars here from accommodation a couple dollars here from flights and a couple dollars here from other things you can add up and save a lot. I think one thing for me, if I wish someone would told me about more about the credit cards, there are actually a lot of four fees mm -hmm. credit cards out there where you actually pay annual fees on that are actually a better return than the free credit card. They give you so much more and so many benefits that the fee you pay is nothing. Like the amount they give you is much more than the amount you have to pay. Whereas a free card would give you nothing. So again, it's something you really do need to research and see if it's within your spending means, if it matches what you use it for. Yeah, as a young adult, I thought doing research was a lot of time, like a lot of effort, but it was worth it for me. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's easier to do research now. These days, it's a lot easier to look up things. Yes, there are a lot more people talking about um, comparisons and it's very helpful. Another thing that we, a chunk of our adult money goes to would be for spending on food. Yes. Food is something we all have to go through. Right now with the pandemic, we have been eating out a lot less. However, let's talk about normal times. Normal times, one thing I always look for is, if I can, I look for if there are happy hour deals. I always look at a restaurant, a little bit of research again. You have to do a little <laughs> bit of research, knowing, you know, looking up restaurants that provide a happy hour menu. That's a big part for me. I really like those. I don't, I'm someone who doesn't mind having dinner early. So a happy hour actually works perfectly for me because usually happy hour ends around five or six. So if it's somewhere near my workplace, I will rush over right away. And as long as you get your order in, you have the rate. You don't have to leave at that time. So I would go rush in and go, okay, I order a bunch of things and then I sit and chill and, and hang out with my friends until we're done. And, and we save a lot more that way. And also because this is one of the things that you, you do in your social life it's not just you going out on happy hours because that's oh, yes. where you say yeah, no 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 i don't just go hunting for happy hour i thank you claire i have to clarify i i personally really enjoy happy hour and the perk of that is on top i look for places that actually offer happy hour menus happy hour for me is actually happy like after work what's the best way to shut off and not think about it is to do a complete 180 and just sit and chat and unwind with some friends. Happy hour played a big part in my life, normal times. <laughs>
Speaking of being economical, bringing out the Asian-ness in us, one of the things that we must talk about as well is all you can eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all you can eat in buffets. Actually, funny thing is that's something we don't do too, too much. Another thing about my family is we don't eat our money's worth with all you can eat some buffets a lot of times. The price they charge us is actually, it's actually not price spending approved. We could probably order a la carte and pay less and still feel full and not feel so sick. Because a lot of times all you can eat in buffets, if you can't really eat that much, it's sometimes not a good deal. For me, the only time I do go to buffets is if I was in Vegas, because <laughs> they're known for their buffets and they have really good, wow, it is really good buffet there. So I think it depends on the specialty, like certain buffets that have a theme, a specialty that it's a really rare experience, you know it's quality. Uh, that's something I would try out. And because it's something that's great, you can try a little bit of everything. Well, that's the thing too. We're we're not super super big on buffets it's just my parents and I when we do go out and eat we really have different tastes ah. so it's a way for us to get all our cravings done in just one place that makes sense and actually that is a good tip then that's real that's price spending approved because ordering every different type of food would cost a lot more so speaking of uh, dining out and ordering in a la carte we've been friends ever since university we've been dining out and there's one behavior <laughs> that we normally don't do yes uh it's something that both of us agree on um first rule of price pending no appies uh, <laughs> um we don't waste our stomach space nor our uh, money on appies a lot of times appies could be things we could make at home or the main entree is the, the one we're there for usually we go to a restaurant for their mains so we're not gonna waste our time or calories on appies. Actually, we never order appies. We all just go straight for the mains. And so that's really part of the price pending <laughs> motto is, yeah, we don't do the appies. No appies. But for me personally though, you know I'm splurging if I order dessert. For some reason, I can't justify ordering appies, but I can justify getting dessert. Some places though, the way they make their desserts and they plate it, it's so pretty. It's something that I wouldn't be able to recreate at home. And so desserts are something that I, you know, you know, I think Claire would know. If, if you're, if you get to know me, you eat out with me. If I decide to get dessert, you know, like, ooh, Emma's doing a little extra today. And, um, <laughs> um, and a lot of times desserts are cheaper than appies. <laughs> <laughs> and they're shareables too. And well, they're shareables. It's just, it takes more space for the main entree. The, but the main thing for me is also like, I just prefer desserts. There's always room for dessert. I rather, uh, spend on a dessert than an appy. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of spending on food, um, one of the things that we kind of do more now is food delivery, just because we can't really go out and we want, we still want to support our local restaurants. So I was someone who never used any of those uh, delivery apps. It's sort of new for us here in Vancouver. I think the delivery apps didn't happen until just- The pandemic. The pandemic. I mean, they existed before, but um people weren't really used they weren't being used as much and like, i don't know i just find the fees really high so i totally not price pending approved um these these apps are totally not price pending approved i would rather eat in at the you know pre-pandemic i would rather eat in or go and actually go order takeout and pick it up myself um delivery was just like here's something this is this is a, you can quote me i love food but I love money more <laughs> and uh, that is very true and so if I have to spend that extra bit on food delivery that actually isn't going towards my food no no that's not gonna happen and also in the past before I lived alone I had a car and now I'm, I've moved out I don't have a vehicle so it's a little harder also to do pickup and with the pandemic um, I try my best to go pick up my food in person but there are days when you just sort of want to have it delivered um, I still don't get much delivery or takeout, but when there are coupon codes <laughs> um, or when there are like the sign up perks, that's when I would order. But I, don't, I just don't want to pay that extra. And also it is to support local too. If you order directly, they actually keep 100% of the profits, right? If you order delivery, there's a cut from the app or, and the company who does the delivery for them. So they, they actually are losing money. Um, it's partly also to support local. Um, how about you, Claire? Do you are you have you been uh, ordering uh, delivery often? For me, the Asian cheapness is coming out as well for not really being fond of delivery fees. I have access to a vehicle, so I'd rather just drive out and pick it up from the restaurant. But you know, sometimes there you also just want to stay back, and you then there comes the 
idea of splurging for delivery fees and the tip that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not so much on <laughs> delivery, but pickup I do a lot. A lot of um, it's my way of enjoying the food that I like and also still supporting the the smaller shops around me. But you're right. Um, these delivery apps, when you initially sign up, you do get coupons and codes. And so, of course, that affects my, my behavior towards buying food from these apps. Because, wow, I'm buying $10 worth of food and I have a $5 coupon. I'm saving. Yeah. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm enticed to use that. And so, yeah. yeah, let's talk about coupons and points. I'm getting very excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> so price spending, really big part of price spending is coupons and points and anywhere you can get savings. So Claire, since you're so excited, what's your couponing like? What is your <laughs> My couponing? Yeah, there are apps for, <laughs> for coupons. And so sometimes if I want to buy things or just grocery stuff, I normally still visit these apps and see which items are on sale. I will mention one thing that I like. Uh, I haven't been doing it as much now that I'm older, but one thing for me, that's part of the price pending aspect is birthday freebies here in canada there are some places that offer you free items on the day of your birthday the keg personally the keg is my go-to since university i've been going to the keg for my birthday on my birthday and one thing the keg gives you on your birthday is they give you the billy minor mud pie which is this delicious ice cream cake that's like there's mocha and vanilla and chocolate fudge and almond shavings and it's so good they give you this slice at the end for free and oh my gosh that i love that and i, I personally really enjoy steak so the keg is where i go every birthday there are a lot of other places that offer these birthday freebies so definitely check and do your research again do your research um for your local city to see what's offered aside from uh, getting free stuff for your birthdays on restaurants there are also like drink places like for me bubble tea shops um they always have these memberships or point systems if you frequent them then it's uh, worth signing up for and then you get your birthday freebies as well yeah so to close this episode price pending top tip is do your research because <laughs> at the end of the day it's do your research and if you decide the value is worth it just go ahead and again these are just things that we live by and things that we wish others would have let us know but at the end of the day your life is yours so you do you mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening if you feel that you were able to relate to the things we've talked about and have thoughts or tips to share or have follow-up comments from our conversation in general, we would love to hear them. You can follow us on our social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel. Thank you.